Choosing your 10 favorite aircraft is pretty tough at the best of times. But what if you've written a book a bit like this one? The Hushkit Book of Warplanes. Well, I decided to contact the guy behind this and ask him to choose his 10 favorite aircraft from this book and the ones that people have probably not heard of. And he didn't disappoint. I probably knew one of them. So first of all, who is the guy behind the Hushkit Book of Warplanes? My name's Joe Coles. I'm the editor of the Hushkit Book of Warplanes and the creator of the Hushkit Aviation blog. Uh, I'd like to talk about some of the aircraft I chose to include in the Hushkit Book of Warplanes, which is a, a great big, pretty crowdfunded coffee table book um, that's absolute opium, heroin, catnip for fans of aviation. And if that wasn't exciting enough, we're actually going to be giving away one of these books in a competition later in the video, so stick around for that. But let's get started with that first aircraft on the list. The Saab Viggen. I love Swedish aircraft. There's something slightly left field about them, and it's an incredible story of technical innovation and unorthodox thinking in the face of a very threatening neighbor. Um, and it's also, we're overexposed to American aircraft in books. And as a British person, you also get very used to perhaps over familiar with British types. So to see something as interesting as the Saab Viggen um, and to talk to um, a fighter pilot in detail about it was fascinating. Um, and this is something we've got. We've got this great big long interview um, with Michael, who is a, or Mikhail, I don't know how you pronounce it, to be honest, uh, who is, <laughs> is a former Viggen pilot. And the, the Saab Viggen um, was a fighter bomber. It was one of the first... Well, probably the first in uh, sort of Canada Delta aircraft. It's slightly different to today's Typhoons and Grippens and Rafales, and that's the the four planes are doing something a little bit different, and they're largely fixed with flaps, but they're still closely related. It's got this very unusual wing, and it's designed to operate in unusual ways, taking off motorways, hiding in caves, and so it can stop and forest clearings, of course, and so it can stop in a very short distance. It's got a thrust reverser, which is very unusual in military aircraft so you have this very unusual looking aircraft and often appearing in the beautiful foa camouflage scheme um, which was a scheme developed in the 1960s for long-range warfare in the swedish landscape uh, which is actually nicknamed uh, vegan camouflage uh, because the aj-37 was an early adopter that's the um, bomber version of the vegan uh, the ja-37 is the fighter version and in this interview um we talk, we talk to the pilot about how it compares, how it can fight other aircrafts. How would it do against Su-27s? What was it like firing the 30mm cannon? What was your most memorable mission? And um, you, do, you found out a lot. It's a very, very revealing and very honest interview about the Viggen. And as it's retired now, you can get the real true story. So that is number 10 on my list, the Saab Viggen. We have the Fiat G55 Centauro into service 1942, which is uh, a fabulous, a fabulous fighter plane uh, used by some horrible fascists, but wonderful engineering. Um, and just before everything went completely wrong for Italians, uh, the uh, they managed to obtain a supply of the latest Daimler Benz 605 engines from Germany. Um, Italians. Uh, the the Italian aircraft industry at the time was wonderful at design, and um, the the airframes were beautifully designed. The only weakness they had was engine technology. They weren't up there. They weren't world class in engine technology. So getting the German engines in and uh, enabled them to build three superb fighter types. All three saw service, but the best was the superb Fiat G fifty five. It was so good that uh, when a team of German experts came in, including the 104 kill Luftwaffe race Adolf Galland, they came to the conclusion that it was the best fighter of the Axis and possibly in the world, and they wanted to produce it in vast numbers immediately. Even Kurt Tank, the designer of the Book of Wolf 190, had nothing but praise for the G55, and he went to Turin to look at its potential for mass production. But they then found out it was very expensive to produce. Um, way, way more expensive 
uh, in man hours than the 109. It took about 15,000 man hours for this aircraft compared to a piffling 5,000 for the 109. So they realized at that point it was superb. It was just too much of a pain to build. So they decided not to. So only 300 of the best Axis fighters were built. And they only saw service in a backwater of the complex for a Nazi client state, whereas there are around 35,000 109s all over Europe. However, in contrast to so many potentially terrific might have been to the war, the Fiat did at least see production and serve in combat, where its brilliance was demonstrated rather than merely conjectured. So I have to put the G55 in this list of the top 10 aircraft of the Hush Kit Book of Warplanes. And um, there's a lovely, beautiful two-page artwork by Andy Godfrey um, of the G55 in the book, which you'll have to see, but it's got a really cool camo scheme and insignia on that. Next, it's one of my personal favourites, the Dassault Mirage 4000, um, flew in 1979. Um, France's Mirage 2000 is a light fighter comparable to the F-16. It's praised for its high performance, its almost telekinetic responsiveness, and it's left pilots of all nationalities giddy with love and respect. So if you imagine a 2000 with twice the power, you have a pretty spectacular aeroplane. And that is the 4000, which, as I said, flew in 79. Same heavyweight class as the F-15 and the Su-27. It was one of the first aircraft actually to incorporate carbon fibre composites uh, to keep the weight down. Uh, and it was probably the first to feature a fin made of this advanced material. It had thrust to weight ratio exceeded one to one in an air to air loadout. Um, it was agile, long ranged. Um, it could have hauled an impressive arsenal. It had a big nose, which could have been, they could have developed a, a, a great radar for it. But the French Air Force didn't want it. And Iran, another potential customer, had a revolution. Um, and Saudi Arabia opted for the F-15 and tornadoes. And despite its huge potential, the Mirage 4000 failed to find a customer, which was an enormous kick in the nuts for Dassault, as the company had largely privately funded the type's development. So the Mirage 4000 is a big, beautiful, incredibly impressive machine that never saw service. But on the bright side, it was used to help develop the later Rafale, France's latest fighter bomber. So that's the hyper electric cake slice itself, the Dassault Mirage 4000. Next in our list of the my favourite aircraft from the Hushkit Book of Warplanes is the Blackburn Firebrand from 1942. Uh, and this is a really controversial one. Um, it's long been slated as being terrible. Um, and indeed, I, I would say it was terrible. But there's some controversy about it. But it's got this long, drawn-out development. It's a very dangerous aeroplane. They only let the most experienced pilots fly it. And also, it doesn't get into service in World War II. Um, the specification for the type was issued in 1939. But it wasn't until the closing weeks of the Second World War that it began to enter service. And despite this luxuriously long development, it was an utter pig, an utter pig in the air with stability issues, all axis, and a tendency to lethal stalls. And there was a litany of restrictions to try to reduce the risks, include the banning of external tanks, but it still remained ineffective and dangerous to fly. Worse, instead of trying to rectify the problem, the fleet air arm started a witch hunt of those pilots who dared to speak the truth about this abysmal firebrand. But my goodness, it looked magnificent, the torpedo slung underneath it, great big, mighty, radial-engined aircraft with terrible manoeuvrability, uh, notably in roll rate, and only two firebrand squadrons were formed, but still utterly charismatic and um, a wonderfully, a wonderfully sexy failure. <laughs> <laughs> but as I said, it's a bit of controversy about this. So on the Hushkit site, there's a counter argument saying the firebrand was actually pretty good. So I'll leave it to uh, I'll leave it to Caliban's very astute readers to look into the story and come up with their own conclusions on that. Um, maybe put comments in the comment section. Next in the list is the F-14 Tomcat. 
in Iranian service. Now, people may tell you this was developed as an interceptor and you should say tish to that because it was developed for air superiority. I spoke to a Tomcat Rio just the other week who confirmed this. And our interview, sourced by the brilliant detective work of Cash Ryan, is with uh, the probably the um, most accomplished fighter pilot living today with an enormous amount of aerial kills. And he fought in the, the horror of the Iran-Iraq war. And he gives a thrilling, absolutely freaking terrifying account of air combat in the 1980s in what was in many ways the greatest fighter in the world at the time. And these stories are absolutely extraordinary. So not only have we got a very, very charismatic, attractive aircraft, this massive twin-engined, variable geometry, well-armed, well-equipped fighter, but we've got it pitched in warfare, not supported by the US, so they're having to improvise missiles, strapping surface to our missiles under the wings, and use it as a mini AWACS, use it in every other conceivable way. And the, the account of this is absolutely extraordinary. And it, and it really is a very visceral um, description. Uh, I'll use the terrible cliche that it puts you in, really puts you in the cockpit, but it does. And it's absolutely have to include the F-14 Tomcat in this list of my favorite aircraft from the Hushkit Book of Warplanes. Whereas the great what-if British fighter might have been the Martin Baker MB5, and for the Italians, as mentioned, it was the G55, for the Soviets, it has to be the remarkable Polykarpov I-185 1941, the King Rat. Um, your viewers may be aware of the Polykarpov um, I-16 being very successful in the Spanish Civil War, um, spectacularly effective um, and this was built on Polykarpov didn't just disappear and they worked on this agile fast radial engined fighter aircraft that was mired in political intrigue and all the usual Stalinist dark soap or soap opery soap operatically soap operatic I don't know all my, my, <laughs> In, in all the craziness of the Stalin estate. Um, but it, it would have been absolutely excellent. And at this point, it's failure. You see Polikarpov being pushed out of the fighter business. Um, Lavochkin and Yukovlev pushing in before Mig and Sukhoi pushing a bit later. But um, extraordinary story, extraordinary aircraft. And in the book, there's a beautiful artwork um, in Eastern Front Colours, um, dirty snow camouflage with flashes of gold and blue and a rather lovely ah uh, next on our list we have jimbo the ketamine jet himself the dornier do 31 from 1967. as with the royal air force in the early 60s the luftwaffe became obsessed with the vulnerability of aircraft operating from large air bases um, the british developed and eventually deployed the harrier but the germans in a frenzy of innovation developed and flew but did not put into service two potentially supersonic vertical takeoff um, fast jets and a massive vertical takeoff and landing transport, the Dornier 31. They also experimented with a zero length launch system for the Starfighter, the, the Zell, based on ideas from the rocket genius um, and occultist sex magician Jack Parsons. As a production aircraft, the Dornier 31 was envis envisioned. Oh, Hang on, can't get that word. It was envisaged, thank you, we got there, as a supplying tactical logistical support to the fast jets itself used used um, forward operating bases, the airstrips on which the Zell fighters were expected to land using arrested gear. So we're going right up front in um, possibly in a post-nuclear setup even. Certainly it's going to be a very ferocious battlefield in a World War Three in Germany. But it turns out that the tactical and logistical support of forward air operations could be well supported by another aircraft that was in development at the time, the Fiat G222, uh, which has been developed in today's Spartan. It offers similar payload range performance to the Dornier with stall, so short takeoff rather than vertical takeoff, at a fraction of the cost, fraction of the risk, 
and a fraction of the complexity of the extremely cool Dornier 31. But eagle-eyed viewers will see this space-age aircraft popping up in science fiction. The Dornier 31 was a very impressive answer to a question that shouldn't have been asked. Technical progress and ambition had run ahead of operational analyses, resulting in flawed requirements, but an amazing looking machine. So it's getting in, it's getting in here, it's high ranking in my top 10. It's the Dornier 31. Next, we're gonna get seriously weird with the Grokhovsky G38, which was never flown and you will find out why. It was a heavy metal monster. Um, in the mid-1930s, there was concepts of the cruiser fighter, the destroyer, big twin-engined, heavily armed fighter with decent range, decent agility. And the G38 was an example of this. It was twin boom, multi-seat, heavy fighter. So kind of similar to the Dutch Fokker G1 or the American P-58 chain lightning. But this was different in, well... It was, there was a few different concepts, but we'll concentrate on one version of it, one version of it. Um, whereas the Fokker and the Lockheed were very large, kind of quite clumsy aircraft, um, the G38, um, which was designed by a young, very renegade engineer, uh, Pavel Inverson, um, and it was transformed by him into a tiny, very mean three-seat aircraft, uh, and that's got a wingspan of just over 13 metres. So three metres shorter than the P-58, um, four metres shorter than the Fokker G-1, and ultra neat packaging. And the crew are in this torpedo-shaped pod fared into the broad wing section. So it's got a very low frontal area, very low drag, very fast, high wing loading for the time, and it would have been really fast. Um, it was cancelled for unknown reasons, which... For that read Stalinist purge. Um, it's intriguing to think what this um, could have done uh, in the defence of the Soviet Union. Um, Ivanson sell, fell victim to Stalin's purges, uh, was sent to a labour camp um, where he was still dedicated to, um, he was still working or assigned to work on aviation engineering where he had a hand in designing the Tupolev Tu-2. Okay, number nine in my list of the top 10 aircraft included in the Hushkit book of airplanes. Airplanes? Where have I gone American? The Hushkit book of warplanes, actually, is what it is. And number 10 in that list is the interview with Sukhoi Su-15 pilot Valery Shatrov. Now, I've read very little um, about first to first hand accounts of flying this it's somewhat equivalent to the f-106 or the f-4 to a lesser extent the lightning actually um it's a fighter interceptor from the 1960s that served in huge numbers um i think there were around 1300 serving defending the soviet union in the cold war and we we find the other story this this the the Soviet pilot side and we hear incredible things about this aircraft like it's often underrated very underrated I would say and a, probably a strong contender for the most underrated Soviet aircraft there's an article actually on that on the Hushkit blog and we find out um, about why the TM flag and F would called the hound dog um, and we find out why they were also called the dove of peace all right, I'll, I won't tease you too much. That's because they only had two air-to-air -air missiles, which was considered pitifully low. But tell that to a lightning pilot and <laughs> see what he says. So number nine on my list will definitely be this incredible interview with the Sukhoi Su-15 pilot. It's an important aircraft, not only in its historical significance at the time, but also as it fed in to the T-10 series, which, you know, the Su-27 flanker, etc. The whole flanker family um, were informed by this this aircraft and um it's interesting to see exactly how good it is in several respects which are very very surprising so that would be my number nine list uh, aircraft on my list of the top aircraft of the hushkit book of war in the hushkit book of warplanes now during research for the hushkit book of warplanes there were some aircraft that were new to me that i was delighted to find and among them was the incredibly sleek, and you cannot argue with me, 
um, Grumman ATS, which was an intriguing design, 1976. Um, it's got the placement of the main fuel tanks in wing booms for a very short, neat fuselage. It's got the intake mounted above the fuselage, very unusual arrangement, and tiny little cannon four planes in the front, an incredibly sleek, very unorthodox design, uh, which I just think, and I'm this is for no scientific reason. It's not necessarily historically important, but just look at the thing. It's absolutely beautiful in every way and a wonderful celebration of the golden age of aircraft artist impressions, which is something like to the 1950s to the 1980s, where you see aircraft manufacturers trying to excite the Pentagon into buying aeroplanes or to convince supporters of companies that the company is doing something but it resulted in these wonderful paintings and i think the ats is the most wonderful of them all and i i'm going to suggest if i can caliban that we have a competition to name the ats unofficially of course give it a cool name and if you let me i will choose the best name and i will give that lucky winner a free copy of the Hush Kit Book of Warplanes. There you go. My name is Joe Coles. These were my top 10 aircraft from the Hush Kit Book of Warplanes. I hope you have uh, a wonderful week and love and aeroplanes from Hush Kit. So a big thank you to Joe there for picking out those aircraft. Um, literally, I could listen to you talk about aircraft all day, mate. It's been great. And if you want to pick up a copy of this book for free today, then all you've got to do is enter the competition. And that's really simple. All you've got to do is put the name for the Grumman ATS in the comments below. And if you start it with name uh, in capitals and then put your name and we'll run this competition for about two weeks and then Joe is going to pick out the winner and we'll contact you. And Joe will send a copy of this to you in the post. And trust me, it's something that you want to see on your bookshelf. So there's no excuse not to enter that competition. So if you want to find out more about Joe and his team, then you can find more details in the description below the video. There's also details about how you can help fund another book just like this. And honestly, the world needs another book like this. So make sure you uh, go and check that out in the description. Please like the video to help it spread to more people. And if you want to watch a video inspired by Hushkit right now, then check out the video on screen. But in the meantime, I'm going to do some learning about the top 10 worst British aircraft. Hmm, interesting.